join me in welcoming Elder Cheryl Taft with today's life-changing word. Glory, hallelujah. Oh my goodness. You know, I felt a little, and I guess you should, feel a little nervous when you stand before the people of God. It's no joke. You know, the scripture tells us those who teach, they will definitely have to give an account, more stricter account to the Lord. And you know, this topic, I didn't really want to teach on it. You know, I was talking to Pastor about his messages, the messages elders have been teaching, and they've all been talking about get ready and preparation, right? Get us all prepared. And so I thought my, ne my message was going to be in line with that preparation, because we don't know the day, the hour. But the Lord had me go another way. And I actually told the Lord, can you imagine? I told the Lord, I don't want to teach you on that time, but why do you always give me these topics? I'm the, I'm the one. Why I got to be the one? But... As for God, his way is perfect. I submitted, and I said, okay, Father, I'm in. And the moment I submitted, I mean, it just whoosh. I know the day, August 8th, that he began to speak to my heart and download and give me information and tell me where to go and what to look at. And as I was doing it, it was like, hey, Siri, make a note, because I didn't want to forget what I heard come into my spirit. So before we begin, let's pray. Father God, in the name of Jesus, I thank you and praise you, Father. As I marvel that I have the opportunity to stand here before your people. I thank you, God, for my dear and beloved pastors, Paul and Cheryl, and thank you, Lord, that they've given me the opportunity to minister a word. And Father, I just pray that we hear you. I know I'm standing here, my voice coming through the mic, but I pray that they hear you, God, that this is you using little old me to speak to you people. Thank you that we have spiritual ears to hear, spiritual hearts to receive, and Father, we will be doers of your word and not just hearers only. Thank you, Lord. Speak through me. I have notes, but do as you please, Father. In Jesus' name, amen? Amen. So the title of the message, as you can see, is My People. I mean, and that was a directive. God said, when you write My People, I want you to capitalize my people because I want you to just emphasize that they, I, we are his people. First Peter 2.9, we'll just get into it with the scripture reading. It says, but ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people that you should show forth the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. And you know the word show forth means to publish abroad. Not our own praises, but to his praises, to his virtues, to his excellencies, to his glory, to his mercy. We should show forth the praises of him. Hallelujah. It continues in 10 and 11, which in time past, we were not a people. We were not a people. But now, say, but now. But now we are the people of God, which he has, which have, once we were a people, but now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now, but now, but now have obtained mercy. Dearly beloved, I beseech you, I, as strangers and pilgrims, abstain. And that word abstain means to restrain oneself 
from doing or enjoying something from fleshly lust, which war against the soul, having your conversations, and in the Greek, that word is anistrophe, meaning that word conversations is anistrophe, meaning manner of life, conduct, behavior, honest. Hallelujah. That whereas they speak against you as believe, unevil doers, they may be, I'm getting this echo, which is actually, could you lower the volume or something? Because I, it's like when I'm on the phone with a customer and I hear myself talking as I'm talking. Thank you. Hallelujah. So that word conversations, I'm going to back up, is the Greek word anis astrophe, which means our manner of life, our conduct, our behavior, honest, hallelujah, uh, commendable, admirable, among the Gentiles, that our conversation among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. Hallelujah. And I want to read it out of the Holman Christian Standard Bible, which says, you are a chosen race. We're a chosen race. We're a new species. We're a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people of his possession, so that you may proclaim the praises of the one who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now, but now you are God's people. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. And you know, that description, we are a chosen generation. It's the things that once exclusively belonged to Israel. They were God's chosen people. We've heard that all the time. They're God's chosen people. But that were the things that once exclusively belonged to Israel, their election, chosen priesthood, and calling are now no longer the property of Israel alone. That's, they don't, they're not exclusive to that because of what Christ has done for us. Hallelujah. Every Christian, we are the property of this being chosen with a property of being a royal priesthood because of Jesus, we have in it an even greater in spiritual sense and measure. Amen? Remember, we are God's people, his own people. We are special because we belong to God. Do you feel special today? We belong to God, and we're not, he takes ordinary people, just ordinary people. God uses ordinary people. We're just ordinary people, people like you and me. And he makes us special, and he makes us chosen. We're talking about my people perish. We are holy nation. We're even described and described Israel like this, but now because in Christ we are a royal diadem. And a diadem is a type of crown, specifically an ornamental headband worn by monarchs and others as a badge of royalty. We are a royal diadem. We have been made royalty in the kingdom of God. We are these set-apart ones. We are God's people. Hallelujah. Ephesians 2, 1 through 3 in the Amplified tells us, and I love it, Brother Kirby has been teaching on Ephesians. The conversations have been rich. His teaching has been exemplar. So Ephesians 2, 1 through 3 in the Amplified tells us, And you, he made alive when you were spiritually dead and separated from him because of your transgressions and sins. And we learned that transgressions are things that we have done. Sins is what we were born into. We were born into sin. And which you once walked, you were following the ways of this world influenced by this present age, 
in accordance with the prince of the power of the air. I don't even want to say his name. It's not worth it. The spirit who is now at work in the disobedient, the unbelieving, who fight against the purposes of God. Among these unbelievers, we all once lived. We all once lived in the passions of our flesh. Our behavior, my behavior, Elder, I know you can say, our behavior was governed by our sinful self. Indulging the desires of human nature without the Holy Spirit and the impulses of the sinful mind, whatever the mind said, do we did. We were by virtue or by nature children under the sentence of God's wrath just like the rest of mankind. And Romans 12, 1 tells us, and I'm reading out of the King James, it says, I beseech you, brethren. And that word beseech means admonish, exhort, beg almost. I beseech you, I beg you, brethren, by the mercies of God that ye present your bodies. Hallelujah, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. And that word present is the, in the Greek is patristame, parist, which means to set aside, to place at a person's own disposal. I beseech you, I beg you, Present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God. It's your reasonable service. You know, before I get into it, I just want to say, you know, usually you don't hear messages about health, wellness. I've been in the health and wellness industry for over 30 years and heard some things, did some things. May not always did what I knew. It's like the shoemaker who knows how to make shoes and has on raggedy shoes. But... It's an information that I've had the privilege of being a part of, and I find that when it comes to talking about health, we may not talk about it as much in the body of Christ. We, we, we sort of stay away from that, and I just have four reasons that I think we may want to stay away. One is that uh, we, don't want, we don't want people to think we're only focusing on ourselves. You know? We, uh, we, you know, we don't want people to think we're vain and narcissistic because we're talking about health, you know what I mean? So we may think it's not really an important topic to talk about, because again, two, health could be vain. You know, you, you, it, it's all about me. And, you know, I think, you know, like I just lost 30 pounds. I'm on my journey. I'm on a journey of, you know, getting healthy, not so much losing weight. Weight is a byproduct of that. But number three is um, we don't think it's spiritual. We don't think it's spiritual. But make it spiritual. Do it to the glory of God. Make it spiritual. Hallelujah. And then four is, we don't want to talk about health because, you know what, we don't really want to be accountable, you know, if we start talking about it, you know what I mean? Oh, my gosh, I don't really want people, you know, how we start, especially when it comes to, you know, taking care of our bodies and, you know, telling people, hey, I'm losing weight or I'm doing some program, and then we fall off the wagon, be like, oh, man, I don't really want anybody to hold me accountable to what I said I was going to do, especially those New Year's resolutions, anybody? New Year's resolutions. And you know what, I want to say this. This is a judgment-free zone. Please receive it as a judgment-free zone. I'm talking to me and, uh, and, as well as to you. It's a judgment-free zone. Please don't feel condemned, feel any condemnation. You know, my story is that, you know what, I, rem I, was, at your, uh, I was at the pastor's appreciation dinner in your beautiful gown. I look so awesome. But I felt horrible walking from the parking lot, you remember, Ken, to the door. I had to stop several times. Why? Because I was out of breath. My heart was beating fast. And that wasn't the first time. I think I was telling Deacon Denise, I have one flight of steps from the bottom uh, room to my house to the top. One flight of steps. I get up there and I'm out of breath. I'm holding on to the steps, breathing hard. Nobody, you guys don't know this. 
And a couple of times Ken saw this. We were leaving the parking lot when we were out of town. I kept saying, guys, I got to stop. And that when, that's when Ken said to me, you need to do something about this. And I said, yeah, I do. And not only that, the aches and the pains. The aches and the pains, you know, coming from the hips to the knees to different parts of my body. The high blood pressure, the lightheadedness, all of these things were happening to me. And I said, uh-uh, I'm a chosen generation. I'm a royal priesthood. I got to do something with God's help. I got to do something. And I started my journey. And as I said, I'm 30 pounds in. None of those symptoms are here. I don't have any. I, I'm running almost three miles a day. None of those symptoms, no blood pressure, no headaches. I was going to do some planks for y'all, but I was like, you know, and I, I was like, I want to wear something casual so I can do a plank. To me, like, don't dare. And I was like, I can still do it, right? I was like, I was like, Father, I mean, I'm, I'm up early, like four in the morning, just reviewing my notes. And I'm like, Lord, what do I put on today? He's like, put on th th that outfit that you, you first originally said you were going to wear. Don't wear no sweatsuit and come in here and do no planks. Okay. <laughs> Hallelujah. But again, judgment-free zone. I love you. So what's the G word? Anybody want to take a guess? Did I say yes? Did you say yes? What's the, what's the G word? Does anybody want to take a crack at what the G word is? Huh? Grace? What'd you say? Gluttony, yes. We're going to talk about gluttony. Yes. We're going to talk about gluttony. I did it. We're going to talk about gluttony. What is gluttony? It's a disordered, disordered appetite. A relationship with food that is obsessive, either excess or defect. What is it? It's the enjoyment of excessive eating and drinking that has been disconnected from contentment in God. You do, we don't think about that. There's something there when we are overeating that we're trying to fill, but we'll get more into that later. Everything we do should be in connection with our relationship with God. How are we presenting our bodies to God? Are we showing God our allegiance in our everyday life? and our walking, and our talking, and our eating, and how we spend time? How do we show God that we love him? I mean, food is good. Come on. Food tastes good. It's a good idea, because it's God's idea. He gave us these taste buds so that we can taste food. But gluttony takes something that's good and abuses it. I said it takes something that's good and abuses it. In a way, because of gluttony, we become slaves to the thing and whatever we are overindulging in. And even though I want to talk more about food, you can be a glutton in so many other areas. You could be a glutton in social media. Don't raise your hand, but I know we got some social media gluttons in here. Over, excessive. What about spending? You could be a glutton when it comes to spending. Can't stop, won't stop. You could be a glutton in so many other areas of our lives. My people perish. 1 Corinthians 6, 19, out of the New Living Translation says, Don't you realize that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, who lives in you and was given to you by God? You do not, do not belong to yourselves. 
1 Corinthians 6.20 goes on to say, God brought you, he bought me with a high price. You must honor God with your body. You know, it was spoken even at Bible study as we were talking about this. It says, someone said, our temples ought to be taken care of. We need to learn all you can about your temple of the Holy Ghost, which is your body. Learn about it. Don't leave it in the hands of others. Don't bury your head in the sand when it comes to this temple. Because sometimes we put little or no effort into the care of God's temple. And here's what the Bible says, not Cheryl. Here's what the Bible says if we take little or no care. Philippians 3, 19, new living. They are headed for destruction. Their God is their appetite. They brag about shameful things, and they think only about this life here on earth. Proverbs 23, 2 tells us, and I'm reading out of the New Living, if you are a big eater, of which I was one, put a knife to your throat. You know, in my story, I wanted to share some of the things that I did I said, Lord, why do you have me speaking about this? Is because you're qualified. I'm like, okay, because I was a glutton. Was a glutton. One of the things I would do was when I go shopping, Didi, I would grab, I'd go straight to the candy aisle. And I'd grab a big old pack of Twizzlers, rip that bad boy off. That may be stealing, but I started eating them things as I'm shopping. I mean, by the time I got to the register, they have gone. I mean, that, what's, my, what's that called? My happy candy, right? I would eat a whole, whole bag of Twizzlers in a day and see nothing wrong about that. Or we went to this uh, club and saw this comedian, and he talked about the cookie claw hand. I had one of those. Who has a claw? This is when you go into the, the, the Oreos, you got the claw. You know, this is how many, as many as you can fit between this space. That's what you grab, right? Right? <laughs> You got the claw, you're going in for the cookies. That was me. No wonder I was feeling as I was feeling. If you're a big eater, put a knife to your throat. The expression, put a knife to your throat, means to curb your appetite or to control yourself, like bite your tongue. Gluttony, biblically speaking, can be summed up as a laboring for the food that perishes. You know, we learned in Bible study, we were talking about it this past Wednesday, we're saints. We're saints. You're a saint. I'm a saint. We are saints. Hallelujah. God has made us saints. It was weird when I first came to Christ and someone would say, Cheryl, you are a saint. I'm like, oh my gosh, if they only knew what I was doing, they wouldn't call me a saint. But the word of God says, I am a saint now that I'm in Christ. You are a saint now that you are in Christ. And one commentator said, it is a shame for a saint to be a slave to his palate. Given to appetite. But again, not just in food, though referring here narrowly to food, can be interpreted broadly with reference to all appetites. Total prohibition is necessary for a person who cannot control his appetites. The disciple can give no place to the lust of the flesh. And as I said, we can be gluttonous in many other behaviors. Romans 13, 14 in the King James Version says, Put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh. 
to fulfill the lust thereof. Remember, before Christ, we did whatever we wanted with whomever we wanted, however we wanted. Proverbs 23, 20 in the New Living says, do not carouse with drunkards or feast with gluttons. And then Proverbs 25, 16 in the New Living says, do you like honey? You like sweets? Don't eat too much. It will make you sick. How many have ever had that sickness from eating too much sweets? Don't eat too much. It'll make you sick. If something good like honey is eaten beyond what one needs, if we fill ourselves with it, then it may cause an unpleasant reaction, like V-O-M-I-T. And we will lose the good thing we thought we gained. Overindulgence in good things is harmful and unproductive. What is gluttony? It's a disordered appetite. If food is dominating, a dominating factor in our lives. There is a right way and there's a wrong way to approach food. And gluttony is defectively approaching food. And we're not talking about fat and skinny. It's not about how you look or your weight size. It's about honoring God in our bodies. And it's about being healthy. There's nothing wrong with being healthy. I always say, you know, I know it's somewhere in my notes, but I want to put it here. You know, we, we die on our own sword. Don't let nobody take us out of here because of some crazy something or other going on. About, die on your own sword. You say when. Not some such situation or circumstance that you and I can control. We can control it. We don't have to be victims. You know, I do a, a podcast and YouTube and stuff, and uh, I have the privilege of exp uh, doing uh, what we call Cherylisms. So she gives the opportunity to share something that I feel strongly about. And if there was a T-shirt, and I love you, Dr. Andrea, and I appreciate you, and I have no negative thing about the medical community, but here's my Cherylism. If I had a T-shirt, I would write, I don't want to be a patient. I don't want to be a customer, because at the end of the day, love you, at the end of the day, it's a business. And I don't want to be a customer. Do you want to be a customer? Because I love you too, Deacon Karen. I love you too, all the medical people in the audience. Love you, love you, love you. I don't want to be a customer. Why don't I want to be a customer? In the book, Doctor and the Word by Dr. Reginald Cherry. He's just talking about his experience. Uh, the, the title of this paragraph is The Godless Void at Medical School. And you may not have experienced this. I love you, Dr. Andrea. Medical school is probably the most godless environment that I have ever been in. I felt no touch of God directly in my life while I was in medical school. This is ironic because medical school was the very place where I was studying the body, the temple of the Holy Ghost. I studied and learned about God's temple without ever knowing who created it. We only addressed physical and mental aspects of men. Spiritual things were viewed as abnormalities. So they don't know. Some of them don't know that this body is fearfully and wonderfully made. It's made by God. So I don't want to be a customer. That's my point. That's my Cherylism. I hope you decide that you don't want to be a customer. Not a patient, but a customer. So again, it's not about being fat or skinny. It's about honoring God and being healthy. Um, we become unhealthy. Oh, and the other thing I wanted to say is 
Anything that I say here, check with your healthcare professional. Check with your healthcare professional. That's something that I say when I'm talking to customers or clients about health. You know, we don't make any claims that our products cure, prevent, and have any effects on illnesses. Check with your healthcare professional. But uh, we become unhealthy when we eat incorrectly. We eat at the wrong time. That late night eating, don't raise your hand. I was one. I could raise my hand because I was one. Late night eating, <laughs> eating wrong or low quality food, you just hungry and whatever's in front of you, you're eating it. Eating too eagerly or eating too much. As saints, as believers, we should eat and drink sensibly. Eat with temperance. We should involve intelligence thinking when we eat. Eat with self-control. But not self-control, because actually the Lord has given us the ability to have self-control. Through what? The fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit. Galatians 5, and 24 says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness, meekness, Here's the word, temperance. That word means self-control. The virtue of one who masters his desires and passions, especially of the sensual appetites. And against such things there is no law. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with, the, with their affections and lusts. That's what we got to do. We got to crucify this flesh because as we know, we, our spirits are perfect. They've been born again. But these bodies, woo, they still sometimes buck. They want to do what they want to do. They want to govern us and tell us what we should do. I've had to put down some things. I've had to crucify my flesh. And not just in the area of food. Things that I saw that, were, that when I was in the world would try to come back into my mind at the most inopportune and unusual times. I had to crucify my flesh and say, no, I don't belong to you no more. Get out of my mind in the name of Jesus. And we got to speak to ourselves when we find ourselves going to, oh, I got a list. Wait a minute. Wait, how far down is that? <laughs> I'm going to get there. I'm going to get there. But before we had no control over our bodies, we didn't. I was saying, I think, on a Bible study call, it, it, you know, I was doing all kinds of craziness. It, 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 didn't, it seemed like it made sense at the time. You know what? Get skied up before you go to work. I was so paranoid that day, Elder. I mean, every time the phone rang, I was like, what, what, you know what I mean? <laughs> you know how that thing makes you, like, so aware of any tiny little noise, you just jump and say, what's going on? But before we had no control over our bodies, whatever we desired, we did. We gave our bodies what it wanted. But now through Christ, we have the ability to say no. Through Christ, we now have the ability to say no. So again, back to the G word. We should adopt a disciplined way of eating. And no, that's one of the things that I did. I got less than 10 minutes. One of the things that I did is I adopted a way of eating. And you, you can't go on these fad diets. I saw something about drinking some purple honey or something, and you're going to lose 25 pounds in two weeks or something. You cannot go on these fad diets because you know what happens. You go on the fad diet, you lose the weight, and then you start eating normally, and the fat comes back and says, hey, I'm back, and I came with friends, okay? So you want to find a disciplined way of eating, one that you can stick with for the rest of your life, amen? So no fad dieting. Uh, let's see. When you eat, try to eat with other people. Do you find that you're more controlled when you eat with other people? 
don't, don't do what I used to do. I know, don't sneak eat. Like, when you sneak eat, you think the calories don't count because nobody saw you eating it. You know what I mean? You grab this and go, oh, no, I used to do it, honey. I used to sneak eat because I know <laughs> if you saw me, and Ken's been on me forever, and I haven't been listening. I finally got the 411. I got, I got Kirby, I got the revelation. Okay, I got the revelation. And when you get the revelation, you will do something about it. Don't sneak eat. And once again, we know food's delightful. It has a significant place in our lives. We see throughout scripture, food gatherings all over how God brought the people of God around food. And we love to gather around food. Hallelujah. But have we been overtaken by the sin of gluttony? Have we been overtaken? Because gluttony is a sin. Gluttony is a sin. Why? Because it's the sin of overindulgence and excessive and greed for food. In the Bible, gluttony is closely linked with the sins of drunkenness, idolatry, levity lavishness, rebellion, disobedience. We don't want any of this stuff when we think about ourselves. Do we? Do we want, do we? I don't hear you. I'm going to rush. John 2, 15 in the King James Version, 15 to 17, says, Love not the world. These are the things that are in the world. If any man loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abides forever. Love not the lust of the flesh. 1 Corinthians 10.31, King James says, Whether... Therefore, you eat or drink whatever you do. I do planks to the glory of God. The fact that I can get, I'll be 69 come next month. And the fact that I can get on the floor and do a three-minute plank, I'm like, hallelujah. I'm like, thank you, God. Thank you, Lord. I'm not walking around all puffed up saying, oh, I can do a three-minute plank. I know I can do three-minute plank because of what God has done. You know, our bodies are fearfully and wonderfully made. Psalm 139.14, if you don't bring it up, it's okay. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. Can you pull up the picture of the finger? I think I have it here, too, because so I want to see what you're looking at. You know, I like to be my own guinea pig in so many areas. You know, I see if it works, and if it works, and I keep going. If it doesn't work, I stop. But I was at work one day, and I cut my finger. Do you see, like, around the middle part of that finger, there's, like, a red little line there? I, I, it was a paper cut. But I said, who? you know what? Let me just do a little experiment here. Let me take a picture of this, and I'm going to check back on this finger in about a week or so. And I'm going to see what this finger looks like. Next picture of the finger. I think it was in two weeks or so. I took this picture today, but that's what it looked like two weeks after I had cut my finger. Do you see any cut there? Why? Did I do anything to, to, to make that happen? Who did that? Why? Because what's going on in our bodies? They are fearfully and wonderfully made. And if he could do that, there's a, a note on my desk that says, our bodies know how to heal itself. We just got to get out of its way. Show, could you pull up that plant? That plant? That plant? Let me see if I can see what you're seeing. Pull up that plant. This plant is older than all my kids. This plant is over 40 years old. I've had that plant since I was single. <laughs> I still have that plant. You know why? I gave it what it needed. I gave it some water. I made sure it had enough sunlight. You know about plants. And I even talked to my plants. I said, you're looking good today. 
I talked to my plants. But I gave the plant what it needed, the sunlight and the water, for over 40 years. And that plant has still been thriving. I mean, trees last hundreds of years, but this is a house plant. And so it is with us. When we give our bodies what it needs, it will thrive. It will thrive. It will thrive. And what did I give my body? You know the difference between healthy food and unhealthy food. So stay away from and limit your fellowship with Burger King, McDonald's, Wendy's, KFC, Popeyes, IHOP, and America runs on Dunkin' Donuts. But Elder, I like that stuff. Let me ask you this. When the shareholders of this, these companies have their meetings, do you think that they're sitting there thinking, hmm, how can we make this food healthier for our customers? How can we make more money? They don't care. They, they put uh, ingredients in there that are not healthy for us. And we keep consuming it. And then we want to wonder why the body is starting to break down. Give the body what it needs, and it will thrive. I want to read. There's so many more things here that I could share. You know, we say, you, know, you ever have, hear that running joke about a woman who not even a woman, but you eat somebody's food and it tastes so good. Or, or you hear somebody that you say, you know, hey, if she, if she ain't heavy, man, don't eat her food. Don't eat. Because, you know, they have this equation that if a woman is heavy, she know how to cook. She know how to burn. She know how to make potato salad and fried chicken and fried fish. She knows how to burn. But usually if a person is heavy, that means they more than likely have diabetes, high blood pressure, and other ailments. And according to the CDC, I'm going to go over a few minutes, gentlemen. According to the CDC, when we're overweight, and I'm still in the overweight category, by the way. I'm losing weight, but I'm not there yet. I went from being obese to now overweight. But I'm getting out of that. My, my, my line for overweight is getting smaller and smaller. I'm moving over into the normal weight category. But whether people who are overweight or obese um, have these fact, these are, have increased risk factors, all causes of death, high blood pressure, hypertension, high HDL cholesterol or low HDL cholesterol, or high levels of triglycerides, type 2 diabetes, uh, coronary heart disease, stroke, gallbladder disease, osteoarthritis. Who wants this? a breakdown of cartilage and bone within a joint, sleep apnea, breathing problems, many types of cancer, low quality of life, mental illness such as clinical depression, anxiety, body pain, difficult with physical function. Chronic diseases are common now in our society. They used to be rare, now they're, they're, they're common. One of every two persons has a chronic disease. And one-fourth of every person has multiple chronic diseases. And overweight is defined by your body mass index, the BMI. Do you know what your BMI is? Find out what your BMI is. The solution. I want to take a few minutes to talk about the solution. God gave us a manual. The solution is here. You know, it's like when you buy an appliance, we bought this masticating juicer, and it says how to take care of it, how to take care of it. And in here, you think God just made these human bodies and say, hey, you're on your own. 
He made them fearfully. He made them wonderfully. And then he's going to leave it up to us? Really? He made it. It's in here. It's in here. It's in here. Genesis 1.29. So God said, Behold, I've given you every plant yielding seed that is in the surface of the entire earth, and every tree which has fruit yielding seed, it shall be food for you. Adam and Eve didn't have high blood pressure. Adam and Eve didn't have chronic diseases. What I want to say in closing is stop buying the lies. Stop buying the lies that as you get older, you got to get weak and broken down and you can't do and you gain weight and you, there's nothing you can do about it. Absolutely a lie. These bodies are fearfully and wonderfully made. God gave them to us, not the devil, and he gave them to us to live the full number of our days in health and wellness. I've been in this industry for 30 years. I've talked to 80 years. 90 year olds, 100 year olds that are still thriving. Don't buy the lie that I just have to accept this because I'm getting old. Don't get me to saying what I want to say there. Don't buy the lie. So, how do we do this? Write down what you're eating. You ever do that? Take a whole week and just write down what you're putting in your mouth. Be aware. Don't just eat haphazardly. Don't just eat like because I'm hungry, I'm just going to throw something in my mouth. Write down what you're eating. Learn, get, get, get a reality check. It's like, wow, I ate that? Yes, I did. As I said, be ye doers of the word according to James 1-2. I have some other things here, but I have to keep moving. We're digging graves, and maybe our own grave, with knives and forks. Don't die prematurely. Don't die before your time. Die on your own sword. And we're disciplined in so many other areas. I've seen it. We all are. But now we need to discipline ourselves when it comes to our flesh. And we need a lifestyle change. And you know, in Daniel, this is what Daniel says. He says, Daniel 1.15, New Living, but test your servants for 10 days and let us be given some vegetables to eat and water to drink. And then down to 15, it says, and at the end of the 10 days, Daniel and his three friends looked healthier. Hark the herald angel sing. They looked healthier and better nourished. Incorporate vegetables. Incorporate fruit into your life. The world overindulges, but we don't. We are children of the most high God, right? We were bought with the price with the precious blood of Jesus, right? We have the ability to tell our body no. I want us to look at just two more scripture and then I'm done. I want us to look at this familiar scripture in light of abstaining from overindulgences. And this is in the area of food, whether it's shopping, spending, social media. You have uh, sexual, uh, excuse me, if there are children in the room, you have think desires that you shouldn't uh, be trying to express if you're not married, overindulgence. Matthew 7, 13 says, Enter ye at the straight gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. Don't be like the world. Wide is the gate, and everybody's going through that gate. But narrow is the way that leads to life. And when you begin to discipline yourself, it's a narrow way. And one translation said, it's, it's narrow because it's constricted by pressure. It's a narrow way. When I'm up at 6.30, 7 o'clock in the morning on the treadmill or on the bike or on my trampoline, nobody's there but me and God. It's a narrow way. But choose the narrow way. 
When it comes to overindulgence, choose the narrow way. Don't go that broad road because the broad road is leading to your demise. We can pray all we want. We're famous for that. But we keep pouring more gasoline on the fire. Lord, put out this fire. Put out this fire, Lord. Huh? Keep pouring more gasoline on the fire. Last scripture. Just be willing to hear God's voice. Be willing to die to ourselves. Be crucified with Christ. Be willing to bring your body, your mind, your thoughts under the lordship of Jesus. Put on the full armor of God so that you can stand. I'll end with this scripture. 1 Corinthians 9, 24. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run their very best to win? I'm reading out of the Amplified. But only one receives the prize. Run your, your race in such a way that you may seize the prize and make it yours. Now, every athlete who goes into training and completes in the games is disciplined and exercises self-control in all things. They do it to win a crown that withers, but we do it to receive an imperishable crown that cannot wither. Therefore, I do not run with a def I do not run without a definite goal. I do not flail around like beating the air like shadow boxing, but like a boxer. But like a boxer, I strictly discipline my body and make it my slave so that after I have preached the gospel to others, I myself will not somehow be disqualified as unfit for service. Church, it's time to shed some pounds. I'm just going to put it to you plain. It's time to bring your body under the lordship of Christ. Stop making excuses and find a program that works for you, and then as the slogan says, just do it. And I want to challenge you. I want to challenge you. Don't be as pastors been teaching, you know, the, the sower soweth the word. And then the enemy comes, you know, he's going to come and grab this up right away, <laughs> probably before you get out the door. <laughs> All right, don't listen to that. You go, go get your burger and your fries. Hey, shoot, I'm having my burgers and fries. Don't let this word get snatched up. Do it. Your life depends on it. My life depends on it. But do it. And I think I am done. As I was in the back, I was asking the Lord, Make sure that I'm hearing that if you are struggling in this area and you want somebody to agree with you, I want to agree with you. If you are involved in an activity that you just can't seem to stop, I want to agree with you for your victory. And if you want me to agree with you, I want you to come and let's pray. There's power in agreement. 
There's power in agreement. There's power in agreement. There's power in agreement. And we agree. What are we agreeing on, Elder? We are agreeing on what the Word says about us. That we're more than conquerors through Christ Jesus who loves us. That it, what Ephesians tells us, that we have been given all things through Christ. That we are far above. Hallelujah. We're seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Far above all rule, authority, power, dominion, name that can be named. We have that. So now we're going to take that same power and not just keep it in its little spiritual box. But we're going to bring it out and use it in this particular area of our lives. Amen? Hallelujah. In mansions of glory. Can we give God praise? Hallelujah. Hey, hey. Hey, can we give him praise? You know, the enemy's being so, he's so stealth, man. He's so stinking sneaky. So sneaky that he could be right under our nose and we don't realize it. Or in this case, right in our mouths. But hallelujah, he's been found out. He's been found out. Hallelujah. He's been exposed. Amen? Hallelujah. Well, we never close a service without giving people the opportunity to receive Jesus Christ into their heart as Savior and Lord. And I wanted to say, if you desired prayer and you're online, you just let them know in the chat. Let them know in the chat, and I will agree with you. We will agree with you and your prayer for your supernatural change. Hallelujah. You know, the scripture tells us in Romans 10, 9 and 10, you know, as I delved into this topic, so many scriptures just jumped out relating to this. But Romans 10, 9 and 10 says, if we would confess with our mouth, believe in our heart that God raised Christ from the dead. If we believe that, doesn't matter our age, our size, it doesn't matter. If we do that, believe in our heart and confess with our mouth that God raised Christ from the dead, that we shall be saved. So, if you have not received Christ into your heart or you want to rededicate your life to Christ, can you pray this simple prayer with me? Say, Dear God in heaven, thank you for sending Jesus to the cross to die for me. I thank you that you said that if I would confess with my mouth and believe in my heart that you raised Christ from the dead, that I would be saved. I say it with my mouth that I believe that you raised Christ. Thank you, God. Thank you, Father, that because of my belief and my confession, I am saved. Thank you for saving me now. I rededicate my life to you. Thank you, Father, for restoring me and receiving me. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Did you get anything out of the word today? Praise God.